سعدني اليوم وشرفني باسمي وباسم مركز البحوث والاستشارات بجامعة الليبية الدولية اني نرحب بكم جميعا في اليوم العلمي الثالث لجامعتنا للاحتفال بالانتاج العلمي للعام الماضي بدأنا العرض اليوم بملصقات العلمية للطلاب عن كل التخصصات بالجامعة وسوف نستكمل عرضنا بعرض من الدكتورة أسماء بوعنز Dr. Asma Abu Anz is a senior lecturer at Pharmaceutical Science at the University of Greenwich, UK. And she's also honorary, honorary lecturer at the School of Pharmacy, University College London, UK. She holds PhD in Pharmaceutics from School of Pharmacy, University College London, UK. She received uh, the highly cited research award Clarivate for 2021 and 2022. Today, her talk titled Reviews comes in all shapes and sizes. Understanding the different types of literature review will provide us uh, a general overview of all various types of literature review uh, with focus on most relevant types uh, in medical research. So, Please welcome to Dr. Asma. Thank you very much. I want to start with the thank of Dr. Salma Bukhatwa and the reason why they asked me to give you a short interview. She can give me a short interview to give you a short interview. It will be from my point of view, from my short interview in medical research. And the reason I chose to, to call reviews come in, in all shapes and sizes is that we come with the perception that probably reviews is one, one shape or one form of reviews, but they could be in different ways. And if you, if you look in the literature, probably you, you, can, you can see that. And um, it can be confusing sometimes is that what actually looks like a, a review and uh, how to evaluate a review. So um, just as a start is that why do we care about reviews? Why reviews are important? And from a clinical point of view, as a, as a um, so for the um, for for us to practice as a clinicians, or if we are um, at university and we are training um, uh, people who work in in the front line, so as a pharmacist or as a medics or nurses or whatever, uh, we we want to make decisions based on evidence. So with evidence-based um, practice, there are different uh, ways to, to explain it, and th there is a focus on it. And the research evidence is part of that um, uh, decision-making process. And for example, uh, John Hopkins, um, they, they identify it as being able to analyze and translate that knowledge off, uh, from the literature into selecting the best um, choice of, of um, treatment or, or um, care for patients. Um, there's also, it's almost like a looking at um, reviewing the practice itself and making sure that if there's an outdated um, a practice to replace it with the most um, uh, uh, up-to-date and most suitable for patients. And for, for to be able to do that, which is to, 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 to get this knowledge from uh, scientific research, we need to be able to um, assess it uh, and evaluate it properly. And that's where views come in um, to meet that challenge, which is to be able to generate a summary of all, if possible, evidence within a, a specific area and looking at primary art studies as well. So 
this is a kind of a challenge, but at the same time, highlights the importance of generating <coughs> reviews and making <coughs> trustworthy reviews and not just kind of uh, of a, a standard uh, type of uh, collection of information. I thought to start by just putting on the uh, Cochrane uh, um, co collaboration, which is a, a not for profit on, uh, organization that's based in, in the UK, based worldwide, where they focus on systematic reviews or high, high quality reviews for um, randomized clinical trials. So they only publish very, very high quality reviews that will inform clinical practice and policy, policy makers as well. So um, it is, uh, it, it, they have a vast library and they have a stringent um, criteria for people to be able to, um, to publish there. Um, and as I said, it's just focusing on clinical trials. Uh, you submit a proposal and then they have their own training center if you want to write for them to be able to, um, to write reviews within to meet that um, quality requirement for the review to be trustworthy. But um, scientific research and medical scientific research is not just about clinical trials. They cross the spectrum of, of research from the, and I think uh, coming from a, from a pharmacy background and in pharmaceutical sciences, we look into preclinical studies, pre-formulation, formulation studies, and with these we really need um, a robust uh, way of reviewing the literature. Um, so probably this is what we usually have in mind when we think of reviews, either their narrative, meaning just opinion, opinion of someone writing about a specific topic, they probably select certain um, uh, papers, there's bias in selection, there's um, uh, not necessarily a very uh, qualitative, uh, quantitative or even qualitative summary. But uh, when we think of systematic review, we think of something which is specific and starts from the research question. Where we th what is it that we want to, um, to, to focus on and to study? And the more focus and specific the research question, the more targeted the review would be and more um, uh, trustworthy. Uh, uh, that would give you a, um, an outcome that you can rely on. So there are four, four processes or four stages, which is about research, the appraisal, the synthesis, and the analysis, and we go through them in a, in a, in a little bit more details. But the systematic review is not just one thing. Between the narrative and the systematic review, you probably have different um, uh, variants of reviews. Um, and, and, and the difference is it's not just about the focus, it's about the details in these four stages. So, why? Well, I thought it's just to kind of list some of the um, reviews that um, there was a really nice um, uh, uh, reference looking at systematic reviews and systematic approaches, and they've listed these all types of reviews. Um, what I would focus on is a, is, a, is a paper, it's a review about reviews, where they're talking about how to appraise different reviews. So what they do is, is they focus on um, uh, reviews for healthcare, and they looked into 14 types of reviews. And it's, it's almost like a generating a tool for you to be able to appraise these reviews and examine them and evaluate them. So what they did is two things. They scope reviews and then examine them. What they, I like what they call it. It's like simple analytical framework, which they generate. It's like sometimes scientists are um, humble in that way. So uh, what they called it is they called it the sal salsa framework. So the salsa framework is for um, these four the stages. First is the search, then from the appraisal, and then the synthesis and then the analysis. So um, you, can, you can take a, a, a review and you can look into these four stages and based on it, you can say what type of review is that instead of just relying on the author saying it's this type of review or other type of reviews. So based on that, they looked into the 14 review types and then they put different descriptors for each stage. So I don't want you to be kind of um, alarmed by the, the massive, uh, uh, but I'll focus just on two in here. So for the literature review, if you can see that under the methods where it says used, using uh, salsa, there's the search, appraisal, synthesis, and then the analysis, it tells you where, it, how large or small the, the search, how um, robust the search was, and the appraisal, which is the qualifiers, the quali how you qualify the, the, um, the quality of your search. So how do you include, include inclusion, inclusion criteria for your search? How did you decide on that? So it's part of your methodology. And then the, um, the synthesis is how you, you uh, look into these data and then uh, organize them, present them. 
Uh, and then the analysis where it could be done a uh, numeric analysis or, um, or it is just a, a, just a way of, of narrative. So if we look at the literature review, it's a very general uh, term. And with it, you can see that there's not much of a structure. So there's no clear description of the search, how big the search is or how small that is. It's, you don't really um, find that. And it's not much of an inclusion of uh, any uh, qualifiers or quality appraisal. But in meta-analysis, and that's what comes in mind when we think of a, of a systematic review, but it's a different meta-analysis. Meta, -analysis, meta -analysis is just up, when you apply statistical analysis into the data that you've collected. So with that, you have to be focused, and the quality assessment is clear. You, you have an inclusion and exclusion criteria, and you will have to present the data in a way that reflects your analysis, so probably graphical or into tables. And that's where you have values of assessing the outcomes from different um, uh, uh, studies, and then you come up with with the uh, with the outcome of saying, is it um, uh, reliable? Is it trustworthy? And uh, if, you, if usually it is for clinical trials, uh, for for treatment or interventions. So how um, successful whether to trust it, or whether to to uh, to make changes to certain uh, policies or not. Um, then you have the systematic review. Systematic review is just because you're not necessarily applying meta-analysis. I think that's the main important um, uh, thing to think about it. When you think of systematic review, you think that you need to apply meta-analysis. But not everything can be analyzed statistically. You might just need a, quali a qualitative analysis. You don't need a quantitative. So with a systematic review, meaning that you followed the uh, systematic um, approach and you've um, qualified your inclusion exclusion criteria, you've clearly um, uh, looked into the, uh, the, the synthesis, how you presented your data, and how did you come up with the recommendation. So um, what they did in this um, paper is that they looked into different um, uh, review articles, and they tried to examine them following that uh, um, ap approach or that framework. And you can clearly see the weakness, even just skimming through the table, that you can see the one that says none is the appraisal. So usually a lot of reviews don't tell you how did they do it. So what, how did they include the papers that they included? How did they exclude the papers that they didn't include? Um, how did they uh, decide on what type of information to collect from that data? So that were what makes the review weak. So even if the ones that says systematic review, you might see that appraisal says none. So they really didn't say much of an inclusion and exclusion criteria. And with the, with the synthesis, just a narrative, so they, they talk you through the data that they found, not necessarily that summarize them into, into a, um, a, a comp comprehensive summary that you can, you can extract more information from. So you just rely on their word, basically, for, for that type of the analysis. So this is just giving um, kind of the introducing the, the tool. So um, I think the take home message from, from the work is that there's overlap in the methodologies of different reviews and that um, we don't have an internationally agreed set of uh, criteria to say systematic review should be this and the meta-analysis should be this, uh, critical review should be this type of, and the mapping review would be that way. So it's more of relying on the author to make that decision or to tell you in their review that this is, uh, I've made a critical review, I've got that, I was like uh, submitting a, a, um, a paper into a journal saying we have done a, a critical review and for the editors to, to either accept that or to challenge it. Um, but we didn't, we didn't qualify it. We didn't say why it, it was a critical review and it wasn't a scoping review. A scoping review would be more general and you try to get as much information as possible to cover as much um, publications as possible. While critical, you might make it more specific. Um, right. So it's an important element as well, which is differentiating systematic review from systematic approach. Every review should follow a systematic approach. Um, and that is where the method is explicit and producible. I think that's important. And probably you look at many um, review articles and you can see that you really can't reproduce what they've done. You don't really know where they got the, um, uh, the, 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 the articles, how did they select them. So if we look at systematic um, approach, it's focusing about, on the methodology and it is about focusing, so you can see clearly that the, the research question needs to be focused. 
and the criteria needs to be clear and explicit. So it's, it, you shouldn't be guessing from reading the methodology, like, because they included this, probably their inclusion criteria is this, or they didn't include that, so probably their exclusion criteria is that. They should say it explicitly. Otherwise, <laughs> it's not following the systematic, uh, systematic approach. And also about the, um, there's an interest of, uh, conflict of interest, which is a, a very important um, element and sometimes we don't think about it as like, I'm a scientist, you should trust me. But it's not the case, you should have clear um, uh, declaration of interest or any conflict of interest. And with Crocran, they have a really strict criteria regarding the, um, the uh, conflict of interest. Because based on your outcome from the review that you've written, <coughs> there might be a change in policy, there might be um, a recommendation for a specific treatment that <coughs> could result in a financial gain for, for, for certain parties. So it has to be um, uh, whatever you're generating needs to be trusted. And even if you have um, a conflict of interest, if you declare it, then that makes it clear. Because if it comes up, if it shows up afterwards, that um, jeopardizes the, the, uh, the quality and the, um, uh, the trustiness of, of whatever you're generating. So declaration of, uh, of interest or any conflict of interest, uh, very, very important. And it's part of any research we do, but, but specifically for reviews, because of the reliance on uh, or their impact on uh, policy making as well as um, other decisions. So um, the main um, examples of, of applying the systematic approach for search is about the, the scope of the literature, so how much you can search. Um, so you see that more um, evident in types of mapping reviews because you, you're collecting as much information or as much data as possible. While the appraisal probably you see a quality assessment in uh, interrogative uh, reviews, so you need to be really, really detailed in what you're including and excluding and why you are um, qualifying certain uh, decisions you made. Then with the synthesis, and that's how much rigor you, you, you apply to the data that you've collected, and that's where the meta-analysis comes in, where the, this, uh, the, the synthesis, the systematic approach is highly applied in, in meta-analysis. Then the, an the analysis itself of how you uh, having your data, is it qualitative, is it quantitative? And um, the last thing is the presentation. How do you present your findings? Because that's also an important part of, your, um, of the review. Um, are you using um, just narrative? Is it easy to follow? Are you summarizing in the table, so it's a tabular? Are you making um, uh, graphical representations? How are you re reducing the data that you've collected and extracting information from it? I think the important thing about review is not just collection of information, it's about being critical, as well as making, some, uh, making sense of it and informing, uh, making a decision out of it, informing um, of the reader of what, what to make out of these data that you've, you've collected. So what I thought um, to look at is to examine an example review using the SALSA framework. So, um, what I thought is, that is to take one of my uh, reviews, I didn't write so many reviews, so I thought to be critical and look at one of my reviews, uh, just res respectively. I think that after doing it, I was like, I wish if I did that before I submitted it. But, um, so this is a, a review about um, uh, looking specifically. So looking at the um, research questions that we looked at, uh, we were specifically looking at uh, one route of administration, which is intravesical delivery for bladder cancer, we looked at specifically at non-muscle uh, muscle invasive um, bladder cancer, and we looked at specifically at combination therapies. So you can see that the research question was very, very specific. Um, it took us time to, to, to come up with even just refining our research question before we started our, um, our search. Um, I give all the credit to, to the students, so Yuli is a, is a master's student and Chance is a PhD student, and she did her, that in, in her first year of PhD. Um, and looking at the, the scoping, we did the scoping first before we started looking into the, um, this specifically. The, the interest comes from, um, uh, from the point of a drug delivery. So I, I'm not a pharmacologist I'm like, I'm, and I'm not a clinician. A clinician. I am a, a, a formulator and um, uh, designing drug delivery systems. And to be able to design a, a suitable drug delivery, we need to be able to understand the route of administration, what's out there and what is missing. 
and where the limitations are. So we were looking into vesicle um, uh, delivery because it's a, uh, it's a challenging, it's, 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 it's invasive route. It's not a simple route of administration as you would, you would give a, an oral delivery. Just a reminder, five minutes left. Sure, thank you. So, um, so with that, we wanted to see what is the, where the area of, um, of um, uh, uh, gap in, in the knowledge. So with the search, I thought to dissect my method. So with the this, with this search, we looked into two electronic databases and we looked in the clinical trials from the, um, from the, uh, from the US clinical trial uh, the Gulf, uh, website. So that's looking at uh, specifically into the search. So the search was, was specific, wasn't too broad. We specifically looked in PubMed and Web Science because that's where we, the interest of the papers that we want are there. So PubMed has, is heavily clinical side and Web of Science is general and we look into uh, formulation as well. Then with the qualif qualifiers, I was happy to see that. Actually, the student did a, a good job in looking into uh, quality, assessment of quality. So we looked into um, keywords, inclusion and exclusion criteria. We specified uh, the time uh, for, for that. And we clearly, um, we were very specific on the intravesical, uh, <coughs> specifically uh, therapies, because it can, it can also have other specific, um, other treatments. And we looked into the, specifically into non-invasive, non, non, non um, uh, and we didn't look into uh, any metastasis as well. Um, and then uh, for the synthesis, we didn't do meta-analysis. That's the weakness of the review that we've done, but it is a, a systematic review. It wasn't a meta-analysis review, but the way that we did it is that we combined, <coughs> we categorized the, uh, the, the, um, the outcomes into different categories. Um, and that took some time to decide on where to, to put the device-assisted um, uh, treatment combination. Do we put it under, because it could be chemotherapy with, with the device-assisted, do we get, put it under combination chemotherapy or put it separately and then we tried to put it separately and then we looked at novel drug delivery um, uh, platforms as well. So the analysis and the presentation, I thought just to give it a, a quickly that we've presented it in a, uh, in a, t t uh, in a tab in tables mainly and narrative. So we use the table and narrative um, uh, type of presentation and, uh, and, and analysis. So we started by the first is the staging of the staging and, and uh, certification because the point is that there is a um, <coughs> the main need for combination therapies for for uh, PCG uh, failure. So P PCG, PCG is the like immunotherapy that is um, the, um, the the gold standard or the first um, line of treatment for uh, for non, non muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. And then we looked at what qualifies as failure and you can see we've seen the differences in, 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 in terminologies between uh, different um, guidelines and then we looked at summarizing all of the um, all of the treatments into um, uh, into different categories and we looked into clinical trials so clinical trials either they published in a in a peer-reviewed paper that's after the, the trial finished or we looked also to um, unpublished so ongoing uh, clinical trials from from the clinical trial register and then we put them into um, uh, different categories and seeing where most of the, the treatments um, were focused and uh, immunotherapy is the key uh, treatment because it's, it's the standard and then you have combination either with chemotherapy or other treatments and then uh, I think the key element was for me is the looking into the uh, platforms for drug delivery because that's the key key things and that's where the gap was <laughs> which is the gap for um, treatment of um, uh, generating drug delivery systems that are capable of giving the, of delivering the combination because the issue the main issue with with, uh, with the combination is that they might have an intravesical one drug and then intravenously another drug or you try to apply intravesical at multiple uh, stages so just a quickly one slide building on knowledge from literature review I think that's important so literature review is not an end once you have a literature review you can it, it build you can build on that knowledge that you've got and this is where the, uh, the PhD of Shams comes in, where she's looking at developing a drug delivery system that's a able to, uh, to, to, uh, to host or to, uh, to deliver um, a therapeutic agent and um, a diagnostic agent. So we're looking to a dye and we're looking to a treatment. So she developed a, a, a vesicle polymeric uh, polymeric uh, vesicles um, called polymorsomes, and we uh, um, successfully were able to uh, load um, quantum dots into it as a, as a way of uh, contrast agent. And then now she's working on uh, 
uh, loading it with RNA, so we look into more into, into gene therapy in that way. So in summary, within the time, um, we, are, we know that literature reviews are a critical part of scientific research, and because of the <laughs> evidence-based um, practice in healthcare, and that's uh, the basic of, of healthcare, um, clearly there is a, a need for international agreed set of type of reviews because it's, uh, it's very confusing and it's just kind of it's, um, it's very wild out there. And then uh, the SALSA framework, which I, was, I thought like it's a, it's a really useful tool to assess reviews, and um, it's important as well to to use reviews as as a way not just to inform policies but to uh, to build on for informing experimental research. One point that I didn't um, include is which is kind of the future of literature review, which is the, um, the machine learning element of it. One, there are um, areas where, uh, uh, where machine learning into for, for natural um, languages, which is the languages that we, we speak, and they can actually recognize it. And I've seen research looking into a, a training for recognizing an, uh, um, written text. So if they be able to recognize, analyze, and um, synthesize uh, from from the from the from the uh, natural um, language, then that's where you can have a more um, cutting the time for the needed for reviews, as well as maybe uh, increasing the quality. But the bias comes in it's still. The bias of machine learning is uh, is still there because uh, you, you you build it based on your um, human uh, decisions. So that's where uh, the main um, limitation be. Thank you. Indeed. I have not heard many talks in this room, but uh, this has to be one of the best that I've seen. Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased that we're moving from Salami to Sasa, which is very interesting. <laughs> uh, you're, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to know that uh, you are following research uh, methodology or reviews into science. Uh, and in the old days, you just went to find the papers and the whatever journals you can access and write a review about. Yes. Um, and um, I, my question is really is, is, is probably independent of uh, the reviews as altogether, because I'm interested in drug delivery. Mm -hmm. And I want you to know your views on drug delivery of serums and paclitaxatum and tocoristans. Do you have any experience in that? And because it is a, it's a major part of uh, what we do in healthcare. Yeah, I think it's it's for um, for drug delivery. Um, I have uh, experience in said areas and with cancer, just joining into more into into cancer uh, treatments or other uh, treatments for that. For me, the way uh, I am a I'm a formulator, so when I come to see a drug delivery, I see the need. I look into the material science or the the material properties of the material of the of the drug rather than the, um, the clinical side. So I start with the material, see what, what the challenge that comes with the material, and then the challenge that comes with the administration route, for example. So when we talk about a specific drug, I would say, okay, what is, what is the limit, what is the current conventional treatment? What's wrong with it? And why, where does the, the, the challenge comes from? So if a drug is um, the treatment, for example, if we look at uh, certain drugs which are poorly soluble, so you, can, you can't really f formulate it in a way that can be given orally. So that's why probably you inject it uh, or um, give it intravenously so it, with a, with a, um, um, instead of polis, you can give it as an infusion. So that's one way of looking what are the, the, the challenges with that. Is it side effect? Where, where the treatment? Um, so that's where we go into targeting where we want the drug to be targeted specifically for the site of action instead of going other part of the body. So looking into pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the, of the drug itself. So with the, with the drugs that kind of you, you, you talked about, I think, it's, um, um, I think <coughs> they vary in the, in the issues with the, where, where, where the challenge of the drug delivery for these systems well, like. Explain to the drug called the the one you put into a patient with skin Yes. We load them with bacteria excel, for example, or with serums. Yeah. And they're supposed to be uh, sort of slow that release. Is, yeah. But I'm, I'm really keen to know what you use as a formulator in that. Thank you. Because uh, the way that with this challenge with the sense and then where the 3D printing comes in uh, is about uh, loading and then what is the type of tumor that you're putting or if it's in the, in the blood vessels um, and the release that you wanted. Controlled release or sustained release? 
and um, what is the stability of the drug in there? Uh, can we formulate it in a way that can uh, control it? If, if it's the current treatment is, is working, there's the, no need to change the formulation. <laughs> but if they don't work, and, and usually it is about, um, the, it is it's loaded, but the drug doesn't come out from the, from the scent. And that is where the, um, the technology of coming, do you formulate into nanoparticles, which can then um, release and then the drug is released out of from the nanoparticles, so is the payload is, is released or not from there. Because usually these drugs, are like Paxotelcil, they have a really horrible uh, solubility in water, so they won't leave the, the scent, they just stay there. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Jiroshi is a full-time assistant lecturer at the Oral and Bacteriofacial Department and also the head of the Supportive Scientific Subject Department at the Faculty of Dentistry, LEMO. He got his bachelor degree from LEMO um, in 2014 and he passed the MFD uh, examination at the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland in 2016. He achieved a regain, a Master of Science in Oral Implantology at Cairo University in 2022. And today, he will present to us his interventional randomized clinical trial study titled Evaluation of the Effects of the Lateral Inferior Angular Nerve Resolution and Poon Grafting of the Nerve Function and Implant Stability, which was published in the Clinical Implant Dentistry and Related Research Journal, which is a Scorpus Index as Q1 with impact factor 4.259. Uh, please welcome to Dr. Joshi to the stage. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here today presenting my research at the uh, third LIMU scientific meeting uh, concerning the uh, posterior mandibular uh, severely resolved ridges. First of all, to introduce my topic, I would like to say, uh, before that, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Rafiq for his uh, input uh, in, uh, at the LIMO uh, committee, research committee, and Dr. Salma. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the uh, inferior alveolar nerve lateralization for an, an introduction. First of all, we all know after teeth loss, uh, severe bone resorption occurs in the alveolar, in the alveolar process. And that's why it's challenging for the clinician to restore the, the teeth after extraction, after being extracted. To simplify the situation, here is the COVID and Howell 1988 patterns of alveolar bone, bone resorption. As we can see here, after extraction, there is a pattern of bone loss. First of all, it's loss in the vertical dimensions and also as well as the horizontal dimensions. Uh, to resolve these problems, we have, first of all, either after extraction, we place an implant, or if we have a thin ridge, we go for ridge splitting, so a procedure which is called ridge splitting, block grafting, guided bore regeneration, adding a titanium mesh, or if we have a low ridge, we could use short implants, all in four concepts, guided bore regenerations, trespass, lateralization, and transposition, which is three different concepts but basically with the same objective, I will be explaining about them in details in the few next slides. As I mentioned, we can extract the tooth and place implants immediately to resolve this problem or to uh, prevent bone resorption. Here's a ridge which is good in width, but there's a, a, an extraction socket so we can place an implant. As I mentioned, ridge splitting to increase the width of bone, we use a saw disc here to split the ridge. Then we could, it could be done in two stages or single stage. This is a case of two stages, adding a bone graft to increase the width. And after six months, we will place the implants. Block grafts, here's a photo of uh, gaining a bone graft from the ascending ramus, so block grafting using a piezo surgery device. All of these are examples for the solutions of bone resorption. But today we're going to focus on the posterior mandibular ridges and the resorption which occurs. So here's the question, what's the main problem 
in dealing with the implants in the posterior mandible. We have this structure which, which is in yellow here, the inferior alveolar nerve. After teeth loss, and there is a bone resorption, this structure is presented in the middle of the mandible. So when we want to place the implant and there is a resorption, we are endangering the, the nerve. So the solutions here, we have three solutions. Either we trespass the nerve, we put the implant either buckled to it or lingual to it, or we, another solution, we would move the nerve from its place and take it to another place and place our implants, which is demanding situation. To reposition the nerve, we have two options. Either we include the interforamen and we call it transposition, we change the position of the nerve to another position, or we take it in a lateral position, we open a window through the bone and take it out in a lateral position and place our implant, and then we put the nerve back in its place. There is advantages of, of course, advantages and disadvantages of this technique. One of the main advantages to retract the nerve and put the implant is that the implant will gain an anchorage from the occlusal surface, the cortical bone occlusally, and the cortical bone in the inferior border of the mandible. Also, there is another advantage, as, as I mentioned before, when we go for blocker grafting, we, had, we have to, 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 to go for two stages. The patient will go for a grafting, and then after six months, after healing, we put the implant. And this procedure, we retract the, the nerve and we put the implant at the same time. Also, uh, we could allow for placement of longer implants. For this, the, the disadvantage, it is a technique sensitive. It does not compensate for the crystal bone resorption. It's also, uh, we could risk the mandible for fracture after removal of bone and putting an implant. We could also <coughs> risk, put the mandible in risk of fracture. Also, which is the most important is the, is the uh, neurosensory disturbances. As we all know that, that any manipulation to the nerve is, it will cause uh, neurosensory disturbances. And that's why our study aimed to reduce this neurosensory disturbances. So uh, we published an, uh, an article which was accepted in the 5th of April 2021 in the Clinical Implant Dentistry and Related Research. Uh, we represent a prospective randomized clinical trial that evaluates the coupled effect of interposing bone graft and securing collagen membrane separation between the nerve and the implant surface versus a group in which we put the nerve, we, we put the implant and place back the nerve on the exposed surface of the titanium implants. And I will be explaining this in details in the few next slides with photos. Uh, our approval and registration, the clinical trial was inconsistent with the Helsinki Declaration of Ethical Approval. The authors obtained written and full consent from all the patients. Also, the study was registered in the clinical trial under the registration number of 03664219. A total of 30 surgical sites was included after calculating the sample size and this study has been enrolled. The patients, all the patients had a computed tomography uh, CT scans while applying an occlusal radiographic scan. All the patients were independent investigators randomly allocated them into two groups. The assigned randomization was conceived of securing the, uh, the tag surgical interference sealed envelope, which was rendered to the operator just before the surgery. Our surgical procedure, first of all, under profound local anesthetic solutions. We opened a full mucoperiosteal flap, as you can see here, and we exposed the bone. Then, using a piezo-surgery device with the predetermined uh, calculations with a Michigan O probe five millimeters posterior to the mental nerve, we did our osteotomy, taking out the cortical outer plate from of the bone, and with the graduated chisel, we take it out with the chisel and the mallet. Then we excavate all the cancellous bone and peel off the cortical sheath around the nerve. As we can see here is the inferior alveolar nerve. We retract it and we place a uh, uh, dull instrument to protect the nerve while we place the implant just behind the nerve and then we place back the nerve. Our study compares two groups. Either we retract the nerve back on the placed implants, exposed implants, or we wrap the nerve with a collagen membrane and interpose it with bone graft, then we close the area. Our measurements consisting of three 
point. Uh, three objectives. First of all, we measure the neurosensory disturbances using the MRC scale, which is the Modified Medical Research Counseling Scale, uh, including the light touch, pain, and two-point discrimination test. Also, we assess the implant stability immediately after placement and after six months using the OSCEL device. Also, we measure the marginal bone loss conducted on the CBCT immediately and after <coughs> six months. Our results confirmed that all the patients, all the patients experienced neurosensory alterations with no significant difference between the two groups, either isolated <coughs> or not. Also, the stability quotient, all the uh, implants survived with, and, and were stable and with no significant between the two groups. Also, the radiographic marginal bone loss, there was no difference between the two groups. As you can see here, CBC sections after placement of the implant six months later, and in the, in the figure A, there is a gap, small gap between the implants placed. This is the radiopic material, which is the implant and the canal nerve isolated from the implant. The gap is too small here. This is the group in which is, the nerve is not isolated. As you can see here, the isolation between the nerve and the, uh, the implant, uh, dense cortical bone formation surrounding the inferior alveolar nerve, which is bridging the gap in between them. For our conclusions, although demonstrated the dense cortical bone, which we can see here, formation surrounding the inferior alveolar nerve canal, and intervening the gap, it neither subsided the neural disturbance nor enhanced secondary implant stability and marginal bone loss. Even though, even though the neurosensory disturbances regained the group in which has been isolated, has been regaining faster, faster than the other group, but with no significance on the statistical analysis. Our recommendations as authors that the inferior alveolar nerve procedure is to be done when the nerve is at the middle of the uh, mandible or just buccal, not lingually. As far as the, as the nerve is pushed more lingually, that means more manipulation, more neurosensory disturbances. Also, we use the surgical guide for, us, for our osteotomy and the implant placement, and to substantiate the outcomes of this study, a larger sample size and longer follow-up follow -up periods are required, which was one of our limitations in this study. Those are our teams from uh, collaborated with us from Cairo University, Dr. Mohamed Atif, Dr. Rami Beri, Amr Jibari, and Dr. Mohamed Hadidi. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> Uh, comparative analysis of anti sars cov 2 srbd IgG levels among heterogeneously vaccinated adults in Benghazi, Libya. The Taliban are the Arab people of Fatima Zahra Sunusi, Asil Al Mahdoui, Noor Al Lafi, Farid Fadan Al Masr. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me, let me, uh, first of all, let me thank you all for attending our presentation. Let me also introduce you myself, Noor al and the mm -hmm. other presenters, Fatma Sunusi and Asil al -Mahdoui. As you all know, COVID-19 pandemic hasn't been eradicated yet, and getting protection against this infection is important to save many lives. Also, uh, almost all vaccines have been released very quickly, uh, and, and their efficacy has been questioned, especially in areas with a regular vaccine supply. Uh, several previous studies were conducted worldwide, but only a few considered the regular supply as a factor. And to our knowledge, no, uh, no such studies were conducted in the country before. So our project is titled as the Comparative Analysis of Anti-SARS-CoV-2 SRBD IgG Levels Among Heterogeneously Vaccinated Adults in Benghazi, Libya, uh, to find out which vaccine would give a better protection against this global issue. So. The contents of our research would include the following, starting with the introduction, then the study's aim, materials and method, results and discussion, limitations, and last but not least, our conclusion. And now the introduction will be started by Fatma. Hello, everyone. I will start with the first part of the, of the presentation, which is the introduction. COVID-19 pandemic uh, began, uh, began in uh, has emerged in uh, Wuhan, China in December 2019 and has been a, a challenging global concern ever since. The inception of the issue in Libya started three months later in 2020 uh, as the first uh, case was reported in Tripoli in 20, uh, 25th of uh, March. Uh, for the most of 2021, it was out of control and uh, the highest uh, 
rate of uh, reported uh, cases was in July of the same year. <coughs> Regarding the immune response toward uh, COVID-19, both cellular and humoral immunity contribute to some extent in protecting against the disease, but here in our study, we are focusing on uh, humoral immunity and specifically neutralizing antibodies. This picture clarifies the uh, interaction between host cell or our cells and the virus, uh, focusing on uh, the uh, focusing on the critical role of spike protein uh, that bind to ACE2 in the receptor, uh, mediating fusion, thus the whole replication of process following, and uh, neutralizing antibodies by blocking this interaction uh, was discovered to be able to. Uh, uh, prevent fusion and replication, thus the, th the spread of infection, and uh, that provided uh, a better prognosis uh, of the disease. So why we chose neutralizing antibodies as a way to assess uh, the efficacy of vaccines? Besides being a blackable and convenient way to measure the efficacy, many studies have found that uh, passive vaccination or transferring uh, passive neutralizing antibodies to both uh, animal models and humans was, was able to diminish the severity of the disease. Convalescent plasma transformation as well had uh, <coughs> saved many lives before the vaccines uh, began to be available. Uh, the WHO has announced the efficacy of each vaccine and as you can see here, uh, AstraZeneca has the highest efficacy, which is uh, 64%. I mean, sorry, uh, Pfizer. Pfizer had the highest efficacy, which is 95%, followed by uh, Sputnik with an efficacy of 80%, 79% for Sinopharm, about 64% for AstraZeneca, and finally 51% for Sinovac. Uh, due to the political issues and civil problems occurred and occurring in the country, the spread of the vaccines uh, were not conducted in an appropriate way and, and an organized way, especially in the eastern part of the country. Uh, so not all individuals got the chance to have a full vaccination term. So with all these issues, we wanted to check whether we would match, whether we, ha whether we would have similar results as the WHO has announced or not. So the aim of our study <coughs> is to provide an up-to-date comparative analysis of the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines uh, by using the neutralizing antibodies quantification as a measure. Also, several studies were previously conducted uh, by, by, using the estimating, uh, by estimating the neutralizing antibodies uh, to assess the immune protection, and our study aims to mimic those studies <coughs> in this area. <coughs> Moving on to the materials and methods, which should be covered by SE. For the methodology, first of all, I'm going to start with the study design, as it was a descriptive cross-sectional community-based study uh, that were conducted between June and October in the Faculty of Applied Medical Science at Lima. The enrolled subjects in this research were adults vaccinated by one type of the five vaccines of our study's area of interest, which are uh, Pfizer, Sputnik, Sinopharm, Sinovac, and AstraZeneca, uh, whether they were fully or partially vaccinated. Any participant who did not match with this criteria were excluded. Uh, this study was approved by the Faculty of Applied Medical uh, Science and informed consent was obtained from the all participants before preceding any step, uh, along with full explanation of, of the procedure and the aiming of this research. Moving on to the data collection, sampling and testing, the data was gathered by a self-administered questionnaire regarding the socio-demographic data of the participated individuals. The samples was collected by taking a five milliliter of EDTA uh, venous blood from the uh, volunteers, and the samples were centrifuge to separate the sera to be placed in a uh, Mendre uh, Cle 900 uh, machine. Uh, and this machine works by a two-step assay named CLIA for quantifying the anti-SRBD uh, anti antibodies by using the CAT uh, CIVD. For lastly, for the statistical analysis of this research, uh, the tests that were done in this research are independent tests, one-way ANOVA, uh, preceded by post hoc analysis for more detailed information. And now leaving you for next to our results and discussion. Just be quick. 
In this study, 111 uh, adults uh, participated, and we categorized them according to their gender, age, type of vaccination, and interval between the doses. By the time of this study is being conducted, the inter-individual differences in both vaccination response was clearly uh, and was evidence that there is a difference in response between individuals according to uh, their gender and age. Starting with gender, 5,600% of uh, the participants were females and the rest of them were males. We used, we used the independent, independent test to assess uh, if there is any uh, relation or change in neutralizing antibodies uh, depending upon uh, the gender. Uh, our, no significant statistical difference was found between males and females. There, there, uh, there was a controversy between uh, 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 studies we founded. Uh, our result matches a study conducted in Jordan, but other study uh, found that uh, gender-based differences is, uh, is found, uh, and females had uh, higher neutralizing antibodies. <coughs> Moving on to interpretation of our data uh, about age. Uh, the most, most of our participants fell into the category of 20 to 40 year old, which, which was one of the limitations of our uh, uh, study. Uh, B value here was uh, insignificant as well. Uh, no significance uh, was found, but in a study uh, conducted in Turkey, they found that uh, group, uh, age group between 40 and 49 had the lowest uh, neutralizing antibodies in comparison to other age groups. Another study uh, published in WHO database also found the same result. Next, moving on to uh, results on, dis uh, on discussion about type of vaccine and interval. Yeah, the most frequently used vaccine was uh, Sputnik with a percentage of about 31%. And the least frequently used vaccine was uh, Sinovac mm -hmm. with a percentage of uh, about 5%. Uh, and in order to assess the efficacy of, the, of these vaccines, uh, we compared the levels of neutralizing antibodies among them by considering the time as a factor. So we categorized the participants according to the time of the last dose they had received into three categories, which are less than six months ago, within six months, and more than six months ago. But comparing the means between these categories was not applicable uh, due, to, uh, uh, due to the... Uh, unequal distribution of the participants between the, between the categories. As you can see here, the, uh, the category more than six months ago had 73 participants, while, uh, on, uh, while we only have six participants in the category less than six months ago. So our results regarding the efficacy of the vaccines, uh, regardless of timing, was, uh, was significant with a p-value of about 0 0.014. Which, uh, which means that there is actually a significant difference between the vaccines. So, for more detailed information, uh, the post, this table shows the post hoc analysis, uh, as it shows that the that the uh, significant differences were mainly between Pfizer and Sinopharm, Pfizer and Sputnik, and AstraZeneca and Sinopharm. Uh, for the interpretation of the previously mentioned results, uh, starting with Pfizer and Sinopharm, our results had observed that Pfizer uh, generally induced high, uh, higher levels of neutralizing antibodies when compared to Sinopharm. Even though our sample size for these two vaccines was limited, which was uh, 16 for each, in Jordan, a comparative study between these two vaccines specifically and with a higher sample size uh, had matched our findings. Moving on for, uh, Visor, for the comparison between Visor and Sputnik, uh, to our knowledge, there was no direct study comparing these two vaccines specifically, uh, but a Mongolian study had observed that having uh, that generally Sputnik and Sinopharm induce lower levels of neutralizing antibodies when compared to AstraZeneca and Pfizer. And finally, for the comparison between AstraZeneca and Sinopharm, we had reached that AstraZeneca uh, is more effective than Sinopharm and inconsistent with our, with our results. Uh, a, study, a previous study conducted in Iran uh, has reported that having one or two doses of AstraZeneca uh, would release a higher type of neutralizing antibodies when compared to Sinopharm. And now I'm going to leave you with the last section of our results, which will be covered by Asil. And now we'll be covering the interval between the doses, which is the most interesting part in our research. Uh, the interval between the doses and uh, of the vaccine that were taken by the participants were categorized according to the uh, period into less than uh, eight weeks between uh, 12 and uh, eight and 12 weeks, and more than 12 weeks. 
Uh, and by comparing the uh, uh, concentration of neutralizing antibodies of different doses, uh, between the first and second dose, the p-value were uh, significant. As you can see here, the, uh, it was uh, 0.007. And by taking a deep inspection, uh, by using the post hoc analysis, uh, uh, the significant difference was between the period of more than 12 weeks and the other two periods. As this mean plot shows that the... Uh, the so, so the highest level of neutralizing antibodies was in the, in the period of more than 12 weeks, with a mean level of 1,400. So uh, this was like the, uh, we were expecting that longer periods between the, uh, the doses would reduce the level of neutralizing antibodies. But the, our results were uh, the opposite, as the, uh, the most, uh, the, as the highest level of neutralizing antibodies was in this categorization. So at first we thought that this because our, uh, most of our uh, people uh, who, took, uh, who took the doses were in the category of more than 12 weeks. Uh, but there was a, another study that supported our findings, uh, a European study that they concluded that uh, whenever you, a longer period between the doses would give a longer protection. So الحاجه هذه يعني هي فادتنا اكثر في الـ في الريسيرش يعني حكينا اسحب هذه نقطه ضعف بس هي طلعت يعني نقطه نقطه قوه ان نحن الانكونسيستنسي اللي صايره في ليبيا وال وان هم ما كانوش ياخذوا في فول تيرم فاكسينيشن الحاجه هذه عطت يعني رد فعل ايجابي بدل من انه يكون سلبي فالحاجه هذه الموست اوف ذا يعني وورد وايد مش واخذينها في عين الاعتبار لانها موست اوف ذا ياخذوا فيه في الـ في الابروبريت تايم and now moving on to the limitation of our study. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Maryam Barayim Farkash, I'm from the University of Libya, I'm with the University of Hans Bermajiyat. The topic we're going to talk about is measuring the satisfaction level of the e-learning used at LIMO. And then a content, introduction objectives, previous studies, method and material, results, discussion, conclusion and future work. بالنسبة للإنترودكشن، إي ليرنينج هي استخدام التكنولوجي والناس يعني عشان نوصلوا مادة تعليمية. التيشرز يقدروا يديروا أبلود وريكورد وهولد ذير ليكشرز أونلاين وبريبير كويزز وبالنسبة للطلبة يقدروا فولو ذا أونلاين ماتيريال سبمنت كويزز أند جوين كويزز. بالنسبة للأوبجيكتيفز، البيبر إنفستيجيتس ذا ساتيسفاكشن ليفل أوف بينيفيشيريز أوف إي ليرنينج أت ليمو. Samples can students will teacher staff members who تم تواصل معهم وارسالهم ال السبيان عبر الموديل. وبرضو ال paper تاعي كانت حد حد discuss the challenges تاعت ال e learning اللي خلتنا نطلع two questionnaires. The previous studies كان في عدة دراسات طلعتن وبالنسبة أول واحدة حتكون تختص بال accessibility with social student with instructor issues. من ناحية الاكسسبيليتي كانت الانترنت كونكشن هي أول معضلة بالنسبة للسوشيال ستودنت اكس اه ستودنت ايشيوز الستودنت ما يقدرش يشتغلوا في جروبس بسبب كمية المقاطعات اللي حيصيرا وبالنسبة للانستراكتور ايشيوز كانت الفيس تو فيس انتر اكشن كانت ضعيفة بالنسبة للدكاترة دراسة ثانية اه تختص من ناحية الترانسميشن والدليفري تشالنج Transmission and delivery in gas mail three axes. Synchronous, asynchronous, blended. In terms of synchronous, teachers need to be able to be live. From the point of view, not from lag. In terms of asynchronous, they need to be motivated, not isolated. In terms of blended, they need to choose materials that they give online. They need to choose well. They give online, and they need to give materials well that will be offline. Collaborative, cooperative learning. اللي هي بالنسبة للكولابرتيف كوبريتيف هي عملية تفاعلية تصير أونلاين وكانت المشكلة هذه حتكون معضلة لأن ما فيش تواصل بيناتهم في الواقع والثيرد إيشيو كانت إيفاليويتن بيرفورمانس اللي هي نسبة تقييم الطلبة كيف تبتقيمهم أونلاين كانت عملية تقييمية صعبة وآخر تشالنج اللي هو إنيبلين تكنولوجيز أنك لازم تختار الإنفراستراكشر المناسبة مع الباندويث المناسبة والدراسة الأخيرة كانت online satisfactory uh, online satisfactory factors لأن كانت three factors uh, في دراسة بجامعية في أمريكا كانت أول factor بالنسبة لهم student 
الفاكولتي ممبرز كانوا يشكوا من ليمتد انتراكشن وبالنسبه للانستراكتور فاكتورز كانوا يقولوا لو في تكنيكال ديفيكولتيز معناه الساتسفاكشن تاعنا حيقل وبالنسبه للانستيتيوشن ريليتد فاكتورز كانوا يتوقعوا الفاكولتي ممبرز انهم يقضوا وقت اكثر وهم يديروا في البرزنتيشن اكثر من تراديشنال كورسز. ماتيريال ميثود الدراسه بتاعي كانت في 2020 2021 نوعين من الاستبيان تم توزيعهم واحد على صعيد الطلبه وواحد على صعيد الدكاتره النتائج كان عددهم 170 طالب و47 تيشر ستاف ممبرز وكويشنير كان مقسم الى ثلاث اقسام بايوغرافي واستخدام الالكترونيك ديفايسز والمايكروسوفت اوفيس وغيره وكانت ال10 اسئله الاخيره يختصن بالساتسفاكشن بتاع الاي ليرنينج الريزولتس كان اكثر نسبه بالنسبه للسكشن اللي هو على اليسار حيكون شور تيتشرز وعلى اليمين حيكون شور ستودنتس اللي على اليسار الجندر لاحظنا ان نسبه كبيره منهم ميل اللي جاوبوا الدكاتره وساينتفك سبيشاليزيشن كانوا مختلفين من عده تخصصات وبرضه نفس الشيء مع الطلبه بالنسبه لل استخدامهم على المايكروسوفت وورد والاوفيس وغير يعني غيرها من المايكروسوفت اوفيس تولز كانوا الاغلبيه العظمى بالنسبه للطلبه والدكاتره هم اثنين كانوا كلهم يستخدموا في مايكروسوفت اوفيس بنسبه كبيره وكويس ممتاز يعني وكانت هذين النتائج الاستبيان نتاعت الساتسفاكشن من ناحيه اي ليرنينج كانت الليفل اوف انتراكشن بالنسبه للتيتشرز كانوا يشكوا ان ضعيفه جدا مع التواصل مع الطلبه وبالنسبه للطلبه كانوا يقولوا ان في نسبه كبيره كتشويش في المنزل لان ما يقدروش يقروا كويس وكيب لما يتابعوا اونلاين ليكتشر بالنسبه للتيتشرز كانوا ياخذوا في افورتس اكثر لما ي... لما يوتوا في البرزنتيشن كان ياخذ منهم وقت اكثر من انهم يديروها كتراديشنال كورس في الجامعه بالنسبه للتيتشرز بالنسبه للطلبه كانوا متفقين ان الدكاتره كانوا مش مقصرين من ناحيه تسليم الاساينمنتس والكويزز اون تايم الانترنت كونكشن كانت معضله للطلبه وللدكاتره لان يصير في انقطاع ضي وغيره بالنسبه للايزنس اوف موديل سهوله استخدام موديل كانت في تدريبات وكان في سهوله في الاستخدام بصفه عامه ويقدروا يحملوا ويقدروا يديروا ابلود او اي شيء الريزولت هذا كان نفس اللي قلته توا بس على ك تكست يعني in conclusion e-learning is a complex task that requires commitment from faculties and can be time consuming بالنسبه للدراسه هذه كانت يعني وفقا لدراسات سابقه طلعت اهم التشالنجز كانت لي اثرا على تطبيق الاي في الليمو ومن هذه التحديات طلعنا اهم الامبورتنت انكويريز اللي كان يحسن استخدام الاي ليرنينج واستخدمناه في على هيئه سيرفي عشان نشوف الطلبه والدكاتره راضين او لا فيوتشر ورك ان ندير انفستيجيت مور تشالنجز ومور كويشنيرز ونديروا اكستند الستادي هذه لاذر جامعات اخرى يعني ونديروا انترفيوز عشان نوضحوا الاجوبه لان مش كل حد يقدر يجاوب بتركيز تام. وهذين الريفرنسز. ثانك يو. Hello everyone, my name is Shahid Al Hassiyah and I'm a fourth grad student in the Faculty of Business Administration and my majority is Banking and Finance Management. My project title is The Impact of Bank Specific Variables on Stability of Banks in MENA Region. So the content of this presentation, I'm going to start by the research objectives and finish by the limitations. The research objectives of this study is to examine whether the capital has an impact on the stability of banks and to assess whether the size of a bank has an impact on the stability of banks, to investigate the loan ratio, the loan to assets and non-interest income if they have an uh, impact on the stability of banks and also to examine the lost loan reserves. So the research importance of the study are beneficial for various stakeholders such as the policy makers, uh, the managers, shareholders and the, also the future investors. So this study outlines the importance of the banking sector in MENA as this uh, uh, region needs to transform its oil-based economy from a market-based economy. 
So the research problem is profitability and stability are a very crucial variable for the survival of this uh, banking sector. So stability of banks helps improve macroeconomic factors, of course, the, uh, the GDP and also uh, many other factors. Examining bank-specific variables provide implications that will be in favor for a sound banking sector. So this uh, project uh, structure in five chapters, the first chapter, second, third, and the fourth, and the fifth. Each chapter provide the, the first chapter provide an introduction, the second, the literature review, the third, the data and methodology, the fourth, the empirical findings, and the fifth one, and the final one, which is the conclusion. This study aims to examine how bank-specific variables impact the stability of banks, specifically in the MENA region. So this study collected 149 banks from 11 MENA countries. So variables used in the study were also collected from the Bank Scope and the World Bank Outlook from the period 2000 till 2015. Here are the definition of variables. Uh, it starts by the Z-score and finishes by the INF, which is the inflation P, which is one of the macroeconomic factors. The regression model, this one has been used in this study, which is Z-score equals B, 1, 2, and 3, and these are the uh, variables. Here are the regression findings. Some of the results have negative impacts on the stability of banks. And uh, two and the foremost uh, positive impacts were the EQAS, which is the profit, and the cost management. The key finding of this study is that capital adequacy has a huge and significant impact on the stability of banks, while the other are influenced negatively by the uh, stability of banks. And findings provide regulators, policymakers, and bank management a brief and better insight to the uh, stability of banks, especially in the MENA region. So this study is limited to that the data set is only from the 2000 to the 2015. And up to date, there's no sufficient number of papers that study the MENA region exactly. So this is a lack in this uh, study. Other variables such as non-performing loans and spending on bank companies were not collected due to unavailability on the bank scope. Thank you for your attention. Assalamu alaikum, doctors and colleagues. It's my pleasure to be here at the third Limo Scientific Day. Our presentation is about dental and anxiety among university students and its correlation with their field of study. Our outlines for today will be introduction, materials and method, results, discu discussion, and summary. Dental anxiety is an emotional state of stress towards dental treatment. It is a patient-specific response, which can be a problem for both patients and dentists. So people with dental anxiety usually delay uh, going to the dentist and delay or neglect uh, dental treatment because of the invasive procedures such as injections, using sharp blades, or drilling their, drilling their teeth. Norman Cora uh, developed the anxiety scale in 1995, who can be a four-question uh, rating scale. Uh, the modification the uh, sorry, Norman Cora developed the 96 dental anxiety scale. The role of modification for 95 the uh, fifth question for God modified dental anxiety scale was the study which I will discuss in the materials and method. The aim of this study is to estimate the levels of dental anxiety between students from different faculties at Libyan International University. A total of 1,988 students were enrolled. Uh, 1,988 students were enrolled to this academic year, 22-23, in Sana Ula and Sana Khamsa Kano at Limo. A sample size of 350 participants with a confidence level of 95% that the real value is within uh, plus minus 5%. As I mentioned, we used a modified anxiety scale, can a rating from not anxious, which indicates for score one, to extremely anxious, which indicates it for score five. 
السامري متاحن يا ما حيعطيني سكور 5 or سكور 25 الكات اوف كم 15 كسامري this indicates ان they are density uh, anxious or possibly density phobic Uh, an Arabic version was added to the questionnaire. Uh, we قمنا بتوزيع الكويستشنير على طلبة الكلية. Uh, شرحنا لهم طبيعة الاستادي متانا وخذينا منهم موافقة. هذه صورة للكويستشنير كان متضمن من the age, the year, the faculty, the gender. أول سؤال كان uh, على the appointment. لو عندك you're visiting a dentist. Uh, ثاني سؤال كان على you if you were sitting in the waiting room. Uh, ثالث سؤال كان if you have about your teeth drilled. Rabbi uh, Sual can ala scaling will polishing will fifth question you are they they added can ala local anesthesia. So 350 questionnaire uh, questionnaires were distributed, 339 were returned, 16 were excluded because they have been completed partially. So a total number of 323 uh, which accounts for a response rate of 92.2%. Uh, statistical analysis was done by SPSS version 19. A total of 130 were males, whereas 210 were females. All of the participants can from the Faculty of Applied Medical Science, with least participants can from the engineer and the business. A distribution of age came from 17 to 28 years, like most of the participants can from 17 uh, to 19 years. Most of participants can know um, in the first year, nisbet 39%. So a total of uh, dental anxiety among Limo students can be nisbet 95.5%. So the highest anxiety score, uh, which indicates for score four and five, uh, was given the applied medical science students, nisbet 23%. The next most highest candidate the in information technology was in pharmacy, nisbet 19.4% and 18.1% respectively. In the other ones, there was no difference. The least anxiety level was given to the Faculty of Medicine, nisbet 38.4% and information technology, nisbet 30.7%. Most of the students in all, the, all departments obtain score two to three, which uh, is moderate uh, and anxiety level. هذا جدول واضح النسب في كل كلية زي ما ذكرت إن ال Faculty of Medicine هما they obtain score one. Most of them uh, obtain score one. While the Faculty of AMS uh, uh, obtain score four or five. Can most participants? In order. Uh, بش نحن نشوفه إنه كان في statistical significant أو أو لا استخدمنا ال one way ANOVA ال p value كان 0.056 which defined إنه there was no statistical significant difference بين mean and anxiety level لي ال different seven faculties. ف lack of dental education ممكن تؤدي إلى patients fear and anxiety. which ends up in poor uh, patients' compliance. In view of the current available data, it appears that further dental health educations uh, or health education measures are required. We study uh, at Jordan University of Science by Wael Omari and his colleagues in 2010 reported that dentist students had lower uh, levels of anxiety uh, than engineering and medical. على عكس our study نحن طلعنا أن medical students with IT had lowest anxiety scale level than dental students. في systematic review cross section study اندارت في السعودية في السنة هذه by Muhammad and his colleagues showed أن percentage of males were 60% whereas females were 40% على عكس study متانا female participants كانوا أكثر من males. So people with high dental fear uh, may prove difficult to treat and they require uh, much more time and they can also be a source of stress to the dentist. So it was conducted and medical students had lowest anxiety scores uh, whereas applied medical science students were very anxious Field of study was statist statistically insignificant, and this is the first study which was done regarding uh, dental and anxiety in Libya. Uh, further studies, طبعا, they, they are required to be in, to investigate the effect of 
correlates. One of the limitations is that the sample size can be quite small. A larger sample size uh, should be obtained from the further studies. Here are my references, and this is our research team. I thank the Dr. Ibrahim Jirushi, who was the first to us in the research, and also Dr. Anada Ben Ali Sahmat in the success of this research. So, by the way, we are ending up our program for today. Thank you very much for all of your presence. We are so proud of what we انتجنا من انتاج علمي للسنة اللي فاتت. رح نعطي الكلمة للدكتور محمد سعد للختام. First of all, we are very proud of what we have heard, and I think a lot of work that has been done not presented today, which is equally important, and I think it is an opportunity for us to see. At least, um, I, want, I don't want to say the best, but um, uh, um, yeah, the, the favorable ones that um, is uh, available for, for us to see. I, and I have a bit of comments. First, uh, we're very proud of the way that the presenters, uh, our students, um, they are presenting the material they are presenting, and I think. Um, if not all, most of them are publishable, and I think they, um, they have a very good chance. And we have to um, encourage our research center in looking after publications. I mean, um, seeing, um, give the, the help needed for these young researchers to publish their work. It's, it's very important. And I think what is important for us is um, Building and um, um, generating the capacity to to be uh, um, a center for um, uh, knowledge production, and a sort of uh, um, good research center. We are coming to a next stage where postgraduate programs are uh, starting, and I think that will um, raise the. Um, I don't want to say the standard, but um, raise the scope um, in getting a more and more uh, valuable work. I think what had been presented today um, gave us the impression that the time was not uh, enough. I should propose that um, we need to have an activity like a journal club where we have a, a, a sort of uh, um, meetings where we can um, discuss uh, and have the, um, have the chance to, um, to discuss this, this important work. What is important today is to give um, the credit for the ones who uh, paid an attention to research and to publications and to um, uh, doing that, that work. Um, that was the aim from our university requirements that everyone has to do a uh, project, has to do um, a sort of work. Um, I was pleased what I have seen and I think we have to um, make more um, and, and expand more um, an emphasis on, on, on that subject. And, I, and I'm sure that our research center will, uh, will look after that, uh, uh, that, that subject. Um, um, I know it is a bit late, I don't want to expand in my notes, but I'm very proud of what we have heard today. I'm looking forward for a um, future where we have um, um, a, a better and, and a more and expanding experience of having this. Thank you very much, and by the way, I um, uh, um, wish you a happy new year, and uh, this is our last uh, year in 2022. Uh, with all its uh, uh, hurdles and uh, all its uh, there, I hope this coming year will be uh, um, prosperous, fruitful, um, peaceful, and a um, um, better year for Limo as well and for country. Thank you.